What Drives You is brought to you by Ziggler, your premier source for equipping life and leadership coaches. Visit Ziggler.com and let them inspire your true coaching performance. Yeah. Welcome to What Drives You. I'm Kevin Miller, your host and guide to help you master your inner drive so you can live a driven, inspired, and peaceful life that sees you drive further and enjoy the ride. In this episode, we're back with negotiation, conflict, and possibilities expert, William Urey. In our previous discussion, we dove deep into the focus of his brand new book, Possible, How We Survive and Thrive in an Age of Conflict. Here, of course, we go behind the scenes to hear what drives Bill in his personal and professional life, how he handles, in this essence, conflict and pursues possibilities in his own world from where he then goes out around the globe, literally to lead and influence others. Uh, William, again, is the co-author of Getting to Yes. He is co-founder of Harvard's program on negotiation and consultant to the White House, the State Department, the Pentagon, and so much more. But Bill, uh, thanks for being back with me. It's a great pleasure, Kevin. Well, I am eager to go through some of these because, my gosh, what what area in our life doesn't involve conflict to some point? So uh, this will be interesting. So to start off, as I always do, on the what drives you aspect, this, the concept is uh, is spiritual in nature, which came up a couple of times in our talks as, as far as how we view things and our beliefs and our identity and whatnot. So what drives you uh, spiritually? Wow. Uh, Big peace. I would say <laughs> if I had to answer that question, you know, there's a phrase in the Bible that goes, uh, the peace that surpasseth all yeah. understanding. Yeah. Uh, and that's a quality of inner peace as well as outer peace. Uh, and it's what I find when I go for hikes up in the mountains, this, the glory, the wonder of it all. And, uh, that feeling of, connection and the feeling of connection with all that is and uh, with all the creation. So I would say that's what feeds me, feeds my heart, feeds my soul and keeps me going. When you look at, we started off our first conversation talking about conflict and I brought up the, just the aspect of belief and how we attach ourselves and our identity to that. And so it's interesting when we look at conflict and even your focus here of, of possibilities, it seems I'm always enamored with the concept of, of spirituality at a foundation, foundational level of being about something beyond ourselves. And I would think that at a core, that has got to help conflict and possibility thinking. Without question, Kevin, uh, that's, I mean, in the larger sense, that's what the third side is. The third side is the whole. Right, right. It's the, uh, and um, in conflict, which we often imagine is, you know, gets reduced to two sides, us versus them, you know, <laughs> Arabs versus Israelis, husband versus wife, labor management, Republicans, Democrats. There's always a third side. And, uh, and that in the largest sense, in the highest sense, that third side is spirit, it's source, it's the divine. It's interesting. I haven't thought about this in eons, probably because it kind of was a fad that went away, but it's the, what would Jesus do? Right. So if, if nothing else, if you don't have a, a tribe to bring around you or a coach or consultant or mentor or whatever, what a, what a significantly grounding or centering aspect to, if you give credence to any greater power that there's the time to turn. So it's not, I, I get that. And that is where you brought it up now that I remember was the, as opposed to me versus you. That's it. Yeah. yeah. It, it's, it's a, and it's an interesting aspect and you, you've spent so many times dealing with other countries, other cultures, whatnot, which we know through the span of time have had a spiritual underlining. So when they, as we ended the last talk talking about when they decide the Bushmen, not to take the spear and poison somebody to their death. And you talked about that, actually, that there was a time of coming around and they would talk and they would also lift their hands up and seek guidance. They would, yeah. In fact, what they would do is they talk during the day and then at night around the campfire, they're all gathered around the campfire. I watch this. And they engage in a kind of uh, 
collective prayer, collective dancing, even called trance dancing, where they 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 bring down visions from 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 on high to ask guidance of how they should how should they deal with the with with the conflict that they have in their community. So they they turn for guidance to you know the larger <laughs> the larger force of the universe. Well, it's interesting as you look at conflict or even just negotiation aspects, which again, this is your, this is your pathway here. This is your arena that have you, it's curious, have you found yourselves at times with acute conflict, sometimes trying to draw them to, I mean, we're, well, it comes back to your third way to the bigger picture, like guys, yeah, come on, you've got to get, there's, there's more at stake here. What about your loved ones, your culture, your family? I mean, there's, you've got to pull it back. That feels like a draw to a, a, again a, con, a concept. I don't feel like it's just semantics, but of spirituality. It is. It is. And you know, the, the interesting thing is um, in these in those moments when you have, as I've had the privilege of sometimes being, where you have like sworn enemies. You know, there's been bloodshed, whatever, between these groups for years or decades. Right. They're sitting down. They're working through their differences. It's the hardest work human beings can do. You don't want to listen to the other side. <laughs> you know, you don't, you know, it's like, uh, you know, you've got all these feelings. When they work through, then there are these breakthroughs where you feel like, they feel like a heavenly presence kind of enters the room. I mean, that's, that, that's peace. And, 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 uh, and sometimes I think, you know, uh, it's, uh, it, you could, it, there's a stillness. Like, uh, I remember once I was, uh, mediating, facilitating conversations between, uh, leaders, Turkish leaders and Kurdish leaders. And they'd been engaged in a civil war in Turkey for, I don't know, 30 years, thousands dead, many tens of thousands dead. And, you know, 3000 villages destroyed and just a, you know, scorched earth kind of war. And, and at one point, you know, they couldn't even actually meet in Turkey. Uh, we had to kind of meet in a very confidential setting in a kind of in France in, a, in an old chateau, actually. And um, and at one point, a retired Turkish admiral said, "I want to say something." And he said, uh, "I just want to acknowledge the suffering that the Kurdish people have been through in the last thirty years." Uh, so many civilians killed, so many villages raised. I just want to acknowledge that. And on behalf of the Turkish Armed Forces, I want to offer an apology for all the innocents who've, who've died as well. Well, you could have heard, heard a pin drop in that room. There was a silence, just this utter silence for a moment before everyone, the, the Turkish participants, the Kurdish participants, you know, broke out in... in uh, in applause, really, because but it was like there was a silence, and that's 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 I think what you're talking about. That that those are kind of divine, transcendent moments yeah. of apology and reconciliation between uh, former enemies. Because that's beautiful. I, I, I'm I'm drawn back even to the balcony concept, which folks, if you're hearing this and you haven't heard part one, go listen to it. But I'm drawn back to that too, of that's the time to step back. And for me to consider, we talked about responsibility and to consider, okay, here's conflict. Get out of myself. What's my responsibility to, yeah, again, the greater purpose, the other people. Um, that's a step of spirituality. Huh? It is. Wow. I well, mean, spirituality isn't just, uh, you know, just it's not just being in church or yeah. it's, it's, it's actually, it's real. It takes place in the midst of life, in the midst of conflict, in the midst of, uh, you know, putting arms to rest and, and, and reconciling. Wow. Well, so on, on that note, a direct step from that is just relationships, uh, which is what we're talking about. So we'll come to that aspect, but I'll come back to you here that to say, okay, you we talked about, uh, you know, we've got the holidays coming up and um, uh, you've got family that you're with and what has, what is driving you at this time of life relationally, friends, family across the board? 
Well, I, I'll come back to peace again. I mean, the thing that I feel grateful for uh, is, you know, different aspects of the family. There hasn't always been peaceful, you know, completely harmonious relations, but it's like, this is a moment again to remember what's important in life. You were talking about what's going on for you in your life. You know, it really puts everything in perspective. What is important? And it's time to, you know, lower the walls, open the hearts, you know, welcome, welcome people and, 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 um, not only set aside differences, but just kind of like transcend the differences and, um, and, and remember the love of a family. And so it's, uh, it's, it's that moment. And I, and I, uh, I'm just feel intensely grateful at this moment for there being, you know, just that feeling of love and peace in the family, which hasn't always been there. So it's just, uh, it's, it's that, it's that, uh, that really drives me that, that that's so that feeling of healing of wholeness. I want to take it then from, again, the amazing is stories of your, in your book of your experiences with, you know, the higher powers, you know, tangibly of our world. And yet you bring that home to your, to your home, to your wife, to your kids. And we talked in the first show about, I mean, obviously it's beautiful when we're in agreement. You know, we joked about coffee and tea. Really? You enjoy, well, you're having peppermint tea. That's my favorite too. That's great. Have fun. Let's sit on the deck and enjoy peppermint tea together. Um, and let's say that we don't, but then we get conflict, conflict resolution. We resolve and find a, a happy medium. How, how great is that? How has it influenced you as you've walked it out in your own life too, with the aspect I'm going to come now to, what we kind of ended the last show with was when there's times when you don't agree, you just, at the end of it, you don't agree. You're not going to resolve it. As you just said a second ago, you're, but you're going to, you want to transcend the differences. I'm going to live with you or cohabitate with you or partner with you or work with you. Even though here's this, you like hamburger. A, I like hamburger. B. We do not agree. I, there's no way to resolve it, but we're going to go forth in peace anyways. That's it. That's, that's exact. I mean, that's, that's what's being called for. I mean, right now our country is in a time of conflict. Uh, maybe as we were talking about before, like maybe more conflict than, than I've, or, or, or you've ever you know, experienced before in this country. And it's really easy to lose sight of perspective of remembering the whole remember. I mean, what I like to do is I remember it like the kids, you know, I, I actually just, uh, <laughs> I have a grandson uh, just, you know, there's a year and a half, you know, we're having Christmas with him and, uh, and, and I call him my new boss, you know, he, you know, I, on the very first day he was born, uh, in May of last year, I had a chance to hold this baby in my arms for, for an hour. And I was just like, feeling the innocence of that being, feeling the pure potentiality, the pure possibility of, the, of that being. And I was just asking myself, what, what kind of world, what kind of country, what kind of society are we going to leave him and his whole generation? Yeah. And if he were, you know, 20 or 30, what would he want us, looking back, what would he want us to be doing right now to kind of create the kind of world in which the children of the world can grow up in. That to me is like, that drives me. That's, that's, that's a central driver. Suddenly I, I realized, okay, I, that I can visualize, I can tangibly, how do we protect this place for our children and grandchildren? That's, that's a tangible drive. You, I'm thinking a minute and I don't want to split hairs on semantics of words necessarily, but I'm almost thinking, so when you go forth, if you're not going to have resolution, is it fair to say, yeah, but we want to figure out a way to reconcile our differences so we can coexist, cohabitate. Is yeah, that? Absolutely. It's that, that, that's what I call transforming conflict. Transforming. You don't have, you don't have to resolve. You don't have to fix yeah. everything. You don't have to end you know, you could still, you could like coffee, I could like tea, you could like this, I could like that. You have this set of values, I have that set of values. We can, we can agree to disagree, you yeah. know? 
we can agree to disagree and and uh and say yeah okay that's where we disagree and and then we can look for where we do agree and you know i've been reading some uh some polls lately because a lot of the polls always show kind of antagonism and polarization but i was struck that over 70% of americans agree with the statement that we americans have more in common with each other yes than not yes we forget that yeah and we, we, you know, you know, if you go back to our basic values as a country, you know, life, liberty, you know, uh, equality, the pursuit of happiness, you know, those are basic fundamental values that made this country great, and that I think almost that all of us really uh, share. If we can go back and remember what we also agree upon. And then in that context, of course, we're going to have disagreements. Healthy disagreement is good. That's what makes for a vibrant democracy. You know, that's what makes for, for progress, for change. When, you know, okay, and, that, and that, that's an occasion. And then within that, it's like, it's really important to me. One of the principles of getting to yes, you know, co-authored so many years ago was distinguish or separate the people from the problem. You can be hard on the problem that you need to resolve, but you can also be soft on the people. You, you don't have to be, you know, sometimes we think hard on the problem means being hard on the person, attacking them, the blame game and all of that. That doesn't do any good. Or we think, you know, if I want to be soft on the person, I'd be soft on the problem. That also does, that doesn't solve the problem. So you want to be soft on the people, you know, respectful, yeah. kind, you know, to... And, and understanding, listening, all of those things. At the same time, you can be hard and saying, we got a real problem to solve. We really need to look at it. We, we can't brush these differences under the rug. You can do both at the same time. You can separate the people from the problem so you can be soft on the people, hard on the problem. In fact, the harder you need to be on the problem, the softer you need to be on the people if the people, the, their, you know, their emotions and so on, are not going to get in the way of solving that problem. I, I didn't know that statistic. And I so appreciate that. I've thought before, if you had opposing sides and you forced them to figure out what their, what their similarities were, what were the, I, I know one time we took the concept because gosh, what more divisive than abortion and said, you know, if you take the people though, and put them, as you said, put them on the same side of the table, you say, man, they are both fighting valiantly for life. It's the That's same it. thing. Same thing. I, well, I love that. Again, it's just one of those things. It's easy to go, poof, epiphany, and yet to walk it out is so counterintuitive. That's it. That's exactly it. And you know, the thing is what I've found when I've watched those kind of conversations, deep conversations about that, that kind of issue, for example, is, you know, everyone prizes freedom and choice, and everyone prizes life, right? Yeah. So if we can just agree on that, and then you say, okay, where can we agree? You know, everyone would agree on how important and vital it is, for example, to reduce teenage pregnancy. And that actually takes care of a huge portion of the problem. So if we could actually take some of that energy that we spend fighting each other and focus on solving the problem and just making sure there is, you know, just reducing those numbers as down to where they're minimal, then, yeah. you know, everyone will be better off. Gosh, it's significant. Yeah, I, I just, what a great exercise. I should do that with my kids the next time they're in conflict. Okay, you guys sit over here. If you want dinner tonight, I want you to come out with a list of the things that you guys agree on or, or, or the values that you, the similar values, you know, that you hold. Yeah, which, is, yeah. which is such a significant yeah. part. All right, Bill, well, the next one is health and wellness. Very tangible one. So if we look at just that, and I know you're a hiker. Uh, you, like me, like to head off in the mountains of our uh, beautiful Rocky Mountains. But yeah, tell me what's driving you today in your pursuit of your own health and wellness. Well, I would say hiking is definitely, you know, my number one practice. I get out every single day. That's why I live in Colorado. Is uh, wow. yeah. there's something about the mountains here, the magnificence, the air. Uh -huh. the clarity, the, just the solitude often, and the, just the beauty just fills me with awe and wonder. And, uh, and I find that it, 
it's actually, it works uh, physically for health. <laughs> it works emotionally, you know, centers me. It works mentally, it gives me, you know, I have my best ideas, my most creative ideas out hiking. And spiritually, it fills me with that sense of awe and wonder. So it's, it's all in one. That's one thing. And then, uh, yeah, th that's, that's probably my number one, you know, beauty, that natural beauty is my, is the balm. You know, people sometimes ask me, you know, cause I spend the day working on conflicts, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, Colombia, Afghanistan, the Middle East, you know, right now, just heartbreaking Ukraine. And what I use to just, bring myself and feed myself and resource myself is those, is that, is that daily contact with, uh, with nature. And if I can, I take two walks a day. And if I can have a meeting, you know, I'd much rather walk than sit. Do you, <laughs> you, know? do you live in a place where you can just take off from your door? Oh, oh yeah. I take off right. I live right up against open space and there's a lake right outside my door and we just go around the lake. Yeah. And there's an old saying that there's no problem in the world so great that it can't be solved with a walk around the lake. I have not heard that, but I appreciate that. I, I live by a high mountain lake. That's my playground that I go right from the, yeah, right from the door. What drives just your interest, your own personal, why, if you look at health, so that's, that covers a lot of things, but just as you look at Bill's health and wellness, why do you want to be healthy and well? What's driving oh. that today? Um, That's a good question. I would say the first word that comes to me is aliveness. I want, I mean, I want to feel alive, fully alive, fully present. And when I have a health issue, like uh, last year, I was working out with some weights, uh, doing some squats, and I, and I uh, herniated the disc in my back. And, you know, I couldn't walk for, go hiking for about five months, you know. And, uh, and so, so just to be alive, and to be here for my kids, for my grandkids, uh, you know, I've got one grandchild, but it's, it's like, uh, to me, health is that, is to give that feeling of fullness to really, you know, really feel fully enjoy the, the joy of, of living to the, to the day that I die. Yeah. And that's why, that's why health is so important. Health is like the basic foundation without that. It's hard to do. Yeah, absolutely. So I hear hiking. I hear so you, you're used to at least to do some weights and and whatnot. Yeah, I do. What about on the nutritional side? Anything that you ascribe I, to there? Yeah, and I also do stretching. You know, I, uh, I, I a lot of you know, like uh, I've, I've I realize I, I especially as I get older, stretching is really important. So I I've taken up some yoga and some other things just to kind of balance. You know, weights, yeah. stretching, and then the and then the cardio. Of course, the hiking comes with that and nutritionally yeah i i also um i kind of have a my philosophy is everything in moderation <laughs> and so yeah. uh you know i i i uh i don't drink a lot very you know last night i had a little couple you know, half a couple of wine but uh you know i uh well, it is the holiday season so. I, I don't smoke and i i drink i mean i eat I eat, I try to eat healthily. I try to eat uh, healthily. I I mostly um, uh, don't eat a lot. I don't eat meat so much anymore. Chicken, you know, I eat fish and stuff. But it, but I I try to eat a, a balanced diet of vegetables and things. So for me, yeah, diet diet is uh, it's, it's what I'm <laughs> I'm feeding my body with for health. So yeah. I try to pay attention to it. I'm you know not always I you know, I, I don't I don't try to do anything too much. I don't go any radical diets or anything like that. But uh, the other thing I, I find too, is I, um, I find uh, intermittent fasting kind of helpful sometimes, mm -hmm. uh, you, know, I, you know, just not just to maybe not eat until, you know, 11 or, or noon, have a, have a smoothie or something like that. I find yeah. that's also, also helpful. Tell me, you have already, the next category is mind, the mm -hmm. mind and your mental health. And I even like to look at it as your mental state, which I appreciate that you just said it was interesting that you're, gosh, you're dealing in conflict. You're dealing with people and emotions and whatnot. And what I 
paraphrase from what I heard you is there's a time to you need to let that go. And obviously a favorite place to go is out into the woods, which I can't, uh, I, I, I couldn't align with more. Uh, but tell me about that, about yeah. the efforts to put yourself in the mental state that you want to be. Yeah. Um, well, I'm fortunate to live in a place like in the mountains, you also get these wide views, you know, views wow. for hundreds of miles. And I have a feeling that that actually helps you in your, it gives you that spacious perspective. You know, you look up at the big sky, you look up at the stars at night. And, uh, um, and I also find that, that, uh, instead of worrying about the world, you know, I used to, you know, as a boy, I used to you know, like worry about like, like um, I spent some time in Europe and, and as a boy and, you know, that you could see the evidence of World War I, World War II, and everyone was expecting World War III. I found that the best way to deal with the worries of the world is to turn towards them and actually do something about them <laughs> if you can, <laughs> you know, whatever it is, it could be something small, but it's like, it's action and it's putting your mind on it, but in a constructive way of what can, you know, asking myself, how can I help? Uh, and, uh, and that actually gives me a funny kind of immunity to worry. Cause as soon as I'm in, in, in activity, uh, I'm doing something about it. It's a, it gives you that kind of immunity that I imagine that surgeons have, you know, when they're doing is like, they're acting, so they're you're, you're kind of immune to, to 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 those things. So I I find uh, I find action <laughs> that kind of mental action of like focused. Okay, um, I'm worried about what's going on in the Middle East. Let me try and do something about it. <laughs> it's interesting. We talked uh, off off camera at least about uh, me having Arthur Brooks. Uh, he was you know on the show yesterday talking about happiness. And talked about his research on what makes somebody happy. And I'll, I'll boil it down. And you probably are aware of heard this too, but he said, you know, is it doing things for themselves? Go get a massage, go watch a movie, go have a great, you know, do, do a thing for yourself or doing things for others. And literally at the end of the day, their research was that you, the happier feelings come with serving others. So it's interesting to hear you say that, that you've experienced that that's what gives you the mental state that you would rather be in. It does. And, you know, I had the f good fortune when I was young, uh, like 20 or something, I decided to pick a question, like a life question that I was going to focus on. Um, what was I going to use my, my one life <laughs> for, you know, and that was a larger, a larger mission, like the one you're talking about with Arthur. And it was a question of, I realized I was really curious about is how we human beings are going to coexist. How are we going to live together? How are we going to work through our differences? Because we're at a point in the evolution of humanity where our minds have devised all these amazing technologies that have enormous destructive potential where we can basically put an end to, to life on earth. And the question is, can we put that same kind of creativity into figuring out ways into the moral, the spiritual, the emotional, the political, the social ways in which we can live with each other? Can we do that? Because it's like there's a race between those two now. And I decided to devote myself to that question of how can we learn to deal with our differences healthily so that we can create a... Uh, and it's the kind of question you can never answer in your lifetime. It you can just work, you can live with, you can work on, you can study. So it's been a lifetime of questing around the world, you know, whether in families or in coal mines or in civil wars in Africa and Asia, in Latin America, you name it. Uh, always sort of looking and asking and learning about that one question. And it's, uh, it's a question that has a larger purpose and it's given my life purpose and it's, and it's just brought, and as I, I like to say, some people, sometimes the mission's impossible, but the company is good. <laughs> That's a good line. You meet the most amazing people when yeah. you go off on a quest like that. I, Bill, I, I am acutely interested. I mean, the, the show is called What Drives You? And you just shared that at 20 years old, you're asking yourself a life question. And it was how are we human beings going to coexist? My experience 
when I was 20 years old, I, I was just all like, I was looking at how to win a, the next bike race. Uh, or, you know, most are thinking about how to get the next date or a car or, or, or whatnot. I'm curious what drove you to that thought. Was there a life experience that you had had, something you'd been exposed to that brought you to that interest? Well, it's, I've asked myself that same question, Kevin. Uh, and as best I can find, when I was like six, I was, grew up in the Midwest and we, uh, we moved to Europe for a year. And we traveled around Europe a little bit. And it wasn't that long after World War II. And you could see the ruins and you could feel it. You could feel the graveyards, you, you know, the cemeteries and, and World War I. Because there was World War I and then 20 years later, World War II. So these two cataclysmic wars. And, and then there was every expectation of a World War III that would be absolutely cataclysmic atomic and so and i could never quite understand what it was that i thought there has to be a better way of dealing with our differences even as a boy i was kind of curious about it and i'd put it away studied history and things like that but but it, it came back to me and that combined with the fact that i that there in school for a while there i was in school with kids from all over you know from different countries many yeah. different countries different languages different religions different uh, and, and I could see that we could coexist. And I thought, well, if we can coexist here in school, why can't we do this in the world? So I had that question in the back of my mind. And I think, uh, when I was looking to, what am I going to study in college? What am I going to, yeah. what, what am I going to focus on? I wanted to have a quest of some kind, you know, that was larger than me, that, that was, and I, and I realized that, you know, something to do with, with humanity, like, like, uh, like a, a question. And, and that was the one I settled on. I'll tell you a story too. Um, I was like 23. Um, I was studying anthropology because I wanted to understand what is it about this human creature here that we need to know for this. And, uh, and, I got a call one night, one night. It was cold January in Cambridge, Massachusetts. I was studying anthropology and, and, uh, it was 10 PM at night and the phone rang and you never got calls from professors, <laughs> certainly on a weekend. And it said, you know, this is professor Roger Fisher. And, uh, I just read your paper on taking an anthropological perspective on the Middle East peace talks. And I, I liked it, and I so I sent the central chart to the Assistant Secretary of State for the Middle East because I thought he might be interested in taking a look at it. And would you like to come work with me? Well, I was just stunned. I was like speechless. I was like, "Am I dreaming?" And uh, and because I never thought that it, like a creative idea, an idea I might have, might be of practical use to someone working on what was widely perceived as the world's most difficult conflict. And I got hooked. It was like, uh, I got hooked on the idea that, that maybe we could use our innate creativity to come up with ideas that could help people deal with their differences better. And uh, I've been on that journey ever since. That's, that's tremendous. I mean, purpose. What a, uh, well, okay. That our next category is work career and business. And of course, I'm supposed to ask you what drives you there. I think we just heard uh, what drives you there, I, though I'll, I'll still go to, I mean, I, I'm sure there's been many evolutions of that, but that early on, well, no, that's an interesting concept actually, Bill, because so, so you knew the direction, the path. And of course, you know, again, just talking with Arthur Brooks about happiness and it's, that's what we want to enjoy the path, not just have a destination. I imagine you've had plenty of destinations like, gosh, I'd like to achieve this, you know, promotion or this position or this opportunity or, or whatnot. And you've done that regardless of those, uh, you have found purpose. And I would assume enduring good to, to his standpoint, you know, happiness and you enjoy the path you're on period, regardless of the fruitions or not of that. Fair? That's absolutely true. It's like, uh, uh, you know, I learned early on and not, you know, to, you, especially you work on these war situations, you know, the chances that you're going to bring some of these situations 
you know, you got to work on them for years, like decades even, you know, like, you know, working on the Middle East, this is one example. So you can't get too attached to the outcome. Mm-hmm. You have to really just prize the journey and the the moments of success and the parts of thing because there's, and there's, for every success, there's setbacks, there are failures. And you just, that persistence, uh, but also just enjoying the process itself of human beings grappling yeah. with their most difficult situations. You know, my, my grandfather, um, who came to this country at the age of 14 alone, uh, with a, you know, from Europe without a penny in his pocket and just started washing windows. Eddie. Uh, Eddie, exactly. Eddie. His motto for his little company was wanted a hard job. job yeah. And, uh, and I feel that's, that's, you know, whether you're in sports and I'm sure, you know, you're bicycling, you know, there's a, there's a thrill in having a hard challenge, something that's really hard to do. And you can't get just, just so fixated, particularly on these hard jobs that there's always going to be success. There's going to be failures. There's going to be setbacks. That's all part of the process. Mm -hmm. The realities of work, I will ask you on today that what's driving you, you like most of my guests, I mean, you've got a book, you know, coming out, you, uh, your reach continues to grow, your opportunities continue to grow. And within that, there's usually cause to be clearer than ever on what is driving your work, what you want to do, what you don't want to do. What are your parameters around there that help you stay again in the path that, you know, right. and be enjoying this? Well, uh, a few years ago, um, about the same time, or maybe a little later than I had this hike with Jim Collins, in which he asked me to sum up everything that I'd learned in one sentence. He said, Darwin could do this. You could do it. You know, uh, that might be useful in these times. I got a very strong, uh, kind of like message, you know, like inner from my inner voice when I was out hiking up and high in the mountains, which was, you know, you're not getting any younger. <laughs> <laughs> so pass it on. Hmm. That, that's just those three words, pass it on, whatever I've learned. And that's really what was the genesis of that book was because Jim also said to me, which is good advice. He said, if you want to write a book, sit down and wait for the impulse to go away because it's going to drive you crazy. If you really want to write a good book and you, I, you, I love, so you wrote about that. I love that. Look for a reason to not write it. Right. Right. Exactly. Like any reason you can have not to write that book. And only if you can't not, not write the book, do you sit down and write it? And uh, so, but in this case, that was a compelling drive. It was like a compelling, like inner instruction from my deepest self, which was pass it on. And that's what I tried to do in that book uh, is really pass on what I've had the the privilege to learn from so many people, from so many different cultures, mm-hmm. from so many different faiths, from so many different uh, walks of life throughout my life. It's just to pass on the essence of what I've learned in a way that could be helpful to the generation of our kids and our grandkids, or today for that matter, as we struggle with the the hard conflicts that we face in today's world. So that's really what drives me. I just couldn't honor that more. And again, as we've talked about, it's timely as I look at my dad, who's been given, you know, literally mere months and uh, uh, he's a, a best-selling author and influencer. And it's been interesting to spend time with him. And there's almost this feeling of going, okay, I shouldn't say almost there has been within me. I'm grappling with a little bit. Of, okay. Now give, give me your best. I mean, it just feels like everything's going to culminate now. Everything's acute. Give me your best. And to his credit, which I, I know as well. Also, he's saying, well, I, I have been, I have been, you've That's been it. getting it for, for years. I thought, what a, what a gift. And, and now with this finite time, uh, it's interesting. We'll see what he does, but I, I know he's feeling like, I, I don't know that I feel called to, I've, I've given my best. I've said what I want to say. I may just hold hands with my wife and enjoy the last days. That's it. Well, that, that, I mean, that's so touching, so moving. You know, I get a shiver when I, when I listening to you, uh, Kevin, it's like, that is the evidence of a life 
well lived yeah. is when you can come to that stage when you've got a few months to live and you can say to your son whom you love, you know, I've done it. I've, yeah. I, I, I've given what I have. And now I just want to hold hands with my wife. And uh, that, that's it. That, I mean, what more could you ask for? Well, it's obviously dramatically convicting to me right now, but what you just said, your experience, even with this book and Jim's question to you, what a gift to talk about relationships. That's uh can't get more profound than that. There's your third way uh, to a massive degree. The next category here, Bill is money uh, is finances is wealth is you know, possessions even. So as you look at that, tell me what's, what comes to, to your mind about what's driven you, what's driven you, what drives you? Yeah. Well, again, this is all just me, so I can't, I'm not offering this as counsel to anyone else, but just my, my own, my my own learnings and lesson is when I was in my early twenties, um, I'm not exactly sure, but I kind of made a vow to myself, um, that I would, I would pursue what I most wanted to do in life. And I wouldn't sell my, quote, sell my soul. <laughs> uh, I wouldn't uh, just, if I could possibly avoid it, just work for just money alone. Because I mean, most people don't even have this option. But it's almost like I remember reading when I was in my 20s that there was a distinction between a lot of people, you know, what we, what we have is a job and it brings in money and it supports the family. It's really important, right? And then some people can get a career where, where in addition to just having money, you know, you get recognition of your peers and so on. And you're lucky if you can actually have a calling, yeah. which is where what you do gives you meaning. And you could have, I mean, you could have a calling and sell peanuts. I mean, it's not a, it's not a thing. It's like, it's like, you know, there are people who on the street just can sell something and they're, 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 they have a, they've got a mission to just connect with every client, every customer. So it's not about yeah. doing something highfalutin, but it was like a calling. And for me, you know, I said to, I would rather, I said, said to myself again, this is a youth of saying this, but I'd rather reduce my needs than, um, than my, my material needs rather than, um, you know, in, in order to be able to do what what my heart most wanted me to do, and uh, and the interesting thing that I found, as I was lucky, uh, and people aren't always that lucky, but I was lucky. I encountered some success early on. You know, I co-authored getting yes, I was uh, twenty eight. Uh, so and it, you know, and it became grad, and it, it kind of like, but. For me, what I took it as is whatever monies came in, for me, I, I took that as a sign from the universe that I was supposed to give back. Mm. And so I was, and so, so I adopted early on that a kind of a principle, which again, people might not be so fortunate, I'm not exact, I'm not, is like, I'm not going to take money for doing anything that is my sacred work, the work on peace. I'll take money if I'm doing work for businesses as I did, you know, helping them make money, I'll definitely take money. But if, but for the work on peace in different parts of the world, I won't. And I'll use the money that I have in business to support the work that I'm doing for peace. That's tremendous. Um, I don't don't know if I've heard a better testimony on money than that. Thank you. Uh, I'll tell you one other, one other thing, Kevin is, and again, I again, I can't say this is universal, but I found curiously that the more I give to the larger whole, the more work I do, you know, for that larger cause, like you were talking about with Arthur Brooks, the more prosperity comes in. Yeah. In other words, the more I'm not attached to the money, but simply do the work for the meaning of it, and I'm not saying this works for everyone or whatever, but it's just been my own personal experience. The more, uh, the more abundance comes into my life. That, that's 
couldn't be more significant than that. And I think that's what we tend to find. And yet, man, again, culturally, that's not where we're at. You brought up the word attachment. We, we tapped on that in the first show, but attachment that, uh, you know, money in and of itself, it's not good or bad. It's a, that's a, that's the old Dave Ramsey term. It's not good or bad. Right. But what we do with it, but in this terms, our attachment to it. And so, I mean, it's powerful to say that as you have not attached to it and gone after the things that really matter without a financial mindset, that it has benefited you well, financially, but in every way. In every way. Yeah. And, and, uh, and again, I'm not, I'm not saying I sort of sense that there's, there's some kind of principle in the universe that the more you give, the more you will receive. Yeah. And somehow because we have this scarcity mindset of fear naturally and understandably, we want to receive before we give yeah. and, and somehow if you can reverse it, there can be a, a kind of a cycle of giving and receiving, giving and receiving. That's like a, an endless cycle. Well, you mentioned, a, I mean, it was the first talk together, a biblical reference, but that you reap what you sow. But right. just the spirit of it. I mean, Bill, I got, I can say that sometimes I'll, you know, talking with the team and we're looking at things and how do we do this with the podcast and promote it and, and whatever. And I'll find myself, it's almost kind of, uh, you know, cold water. It's like, okay, wait, what are we doing this for? I mean, if we're just looking for downloads, then we could just, you know, talk about sex, I guess, apparently, or crime. Uh, that's what seems to get the most. We got a purpose here. What and man, bringing myself back to that is so. Oh, it's like it's like the shoulders go down, the peace comes, and then I would say it's probably when the opportunity unfolds. That's it. Well, possibly. And exactly. That's it, Kevin. And I, I would suggest, I would dare to suggest that actually, when your shoulders go down, you are at your best. Yeah. And when you are at your best, and your very best is coming out of you, whether it's in monetary ways or other ways. You know, you're just you're going to be living a life of of greater abundance, and uh, uh, and if you go the other way of living in fear and scarcity, uh -huh. there is a little bit of a self confirming prophecy there as well. I, I'm thinking, sitting here thinking I should have my team business meetings after we do a show like this. After <laughs> we do a show, it's, that's when I'm the most centered on what what matters. Uh, yeah, that's it. Before, is right here. Um. Tell me about achievements. That's one I give focus to in my book of how we find so much, you know, value and even our, yeah, our purpose and calling in, in some of the achievements, not in and of themselves. Um, but as we look at that, you know, as you look forward and you found your purpose, you found a calling, what drives you towards or is towards things that you may still want to, you still have out there, you still like to achieve. That's a really good question. Um, I mean, at this point in life, I would say, you know, my... Right now, as I kind of reflect on where I am in life, uh, I just... Uh, this, this year, I just had my 70th birthday mm -hmm. <laughs> just a couple of months ago. And you know, I was like, okay, <laughs> you know, you're, you're at that biblical age of three score and 10, and maybe it's not the, quite the same 70 as it was back in biblical days, but I, I just, I, I thought, what do I most want? Like an achievement, you know, like, like you're saying. And so I, I, uh, I took a week by myself, uh, out, out in the wilderness, uh, at the foot of a mountain, high, very high mountain, mountain by a mountain stream in, in the wilderness and just spent the week just camped out i didn't do much hiking just sort of sat there and listened to the stream and uh and you know just reflected with gratitude on my life and you know did a little bit of an accounting and just slowed down because that's the thing is life gets so fast and with me social media and everything like that but just slow down and I actually have nothing to do i didn't bring any books i brought a journal to write in but i just like okay just let me sit with nature here and sit sit and uh and you know in that moment that's that's all i wanted <laughs> i realized that right there under my 
knows was just like being able to just be, you know, the achievement of just, just to be and have my heart be full with gratitude for all the people I'd known, all the people I'd loved, all the people who'd loved me, all the people I'd met, uh, and, uh, and just all the beauty. And funny thing is I was afraid I was going to feel lonely. Mm-hmm. And in the end, I didn't. I've had the company of the, you know, obviously the, the trees, the birds, the mountain, but, but mostly all the kind of, even the beings that I, you know, the human beings, you know, they were present for me. And that was, uh, that was a kind of an epiphany for me that actually um, less is more that actually you know, I was thinking of going away and doing something, a big trip. And I thought, no, just spend, give yourself, it was five days and five nights. Uh, and, and by the end of it, I was thinking I could probably continue this. <laughs> and, you know, I, I, you know, I bathed in the stream. I just like, you know, did whatever, you know, just, but there was nothing to do. And it was just like, just pure gratitude. And that, that, that to me was, <laughs> was, I don't know if it answers your question of achievement, but that's, that's what felt to me like the, the, you know, the achievement is, is as much inside myself right now. It's not so much in terms of outer achievements. I, I know it's beautiful. It, I, it's alignment it has alignment. I asked the same thing to Robert, uh, Bob Waldinger. We talked about that. And he said, you know, I've got things I want to achieve right now. I'm just more interested in enjoying the path that I'm on. And, and this term of being keeps uh, coming up. I think I talked about it recently with uh, Thomas Hubel. Who I, I saw you were on his show. Yeah. Yeah. He's a friend of mine. Uh, okay. Oh gosh. Okay. Well, I, I'm new. I'm new to his acquaintance and, and we did a series. Actually, he's still, co- he's coming back on to do another show. Um, I think right after the first of the year, but this aspect of being, and it's, I'll, I'll tell you, it's interesting, Bill, this year was a big year of uh, adventures. I did, I got involved with the guys group of adventurers and, and just, uh, we went, uh, we went out of country and we did all kinds of stuff and it was great. And I don't feel that call at the moment this year. And I actually told a friend recently, I thought, I may just go to a monastery for a week or something, though your idea of just hitting a stream and not mountain biking, not hiking, not kayaking, not whatever. I may have to ask you where that was, and uh, yeah, and go where, yeah. go where that is. It's just over the mountains from where you are in the San Luis Valley, okay. <laughs> which is a huge empty valley with the Sangre de Cristo Mountains, and yeah. uh, and the, uh, you know, speaking of adventure, uh, you mentioned that because that when we were talking earlier, that word, you know. For me, life is an adventure, and early on, that's why, I, as, as a quest, okay, what's the question? You know, I'm, a, I'm, I'm on an adventure to answer this question. And I became an anthropologist because anthropology was just, for me, a license to be curious and wander the world and ask, answer that question. And I became a negotiator because I wanted to get my hands dirty. I wanted to really not just observe, but participate actively right. in, in, in the process. And, you know, one, one thing... Uh, that we haven't talked about is about uh, 20 years ago, um, after 9-11, after the war in Afghanistan and Iraq, and I was thinking, wow, where's the world going right now? And I was you know, thinking, we're, there's so much separation. People are getting so separated. Mm-hmm. What can actually bring us together? What can connect us? And I was here on this lake here talking with some friends having a dinner under the August night sky, and they had just come back from the Middle East, from Syria, from I don't know, from Gaza. I don't know where it was, and talking about all the pain there. And and I had the idea of like, because they they were leading a kind of like pilgrimage there. And I said, Well, has anyone ever retraced the ancient route of Abraham? You know, because mm-hmm. as an anthropologist, I appreciate the power of a story. Mm-hmm. And uh and like, you know, walking through the Middle East, because he's kind of like the legendary ancestor of everybody, you know, at least of these yeah. three great faiths and half the world's population. And, and it's like, I didn't know much about him, but I, that, you know, I, you know, I, you know, I thought, what if there could be a long distance walking trail, like the Appalachian trail yeah. or yeah. the Pacific coast trail, or there's this uh, path in Europe, the Santiago de Compostela, this pilgrimage. And I thought, what about that? And people said, that is the craziest idea. I mean, that, I mean, are you crazy? You get walk in the Middle East. I mean, there are wars going on there and who's going to want to walk there and whatever. 
And I, you know, I let the idea go, but it would it just kept on coming back to me. And I felt like, okay, what do I know about creating a walking path, a long distance walking path? Well, the you know, just I decided, well, let me just go over and see what happens. And anyway, so I've spent the last 20 years working on that project, met wow. the most amazing people, had the most amazing adventures, going into what many people might imagine is the heart of darkness, you know, walking right through, you know, Palestine, places of Jesus and everything, and, and Mary and those all those stories in Jordan and Syria and Turkey and Sinai, you know, climbing up Mount Sinai yeah. where Moses was. And, uh, and now there are literally, thanks to the efforts, you know, that, you know, got inspired by this, there are, there's thousands of kilometers of this path called the Abraham path in many different countries. And there are hundreds and thousands of people who walk little sections of it. And it's, it's for the generations. You know, I said, this is a hundred year project, but it was kind of a crazy idea, foolish idea, but just, it just, again, to, to connect, you know, just to, to connect with yourself, connect with others. I am completely ignorant of it. And that's, profound to me. Where is there, where can you find information on that? Well, there's a website, abrahampath.org, oh. or you can just put Abraham path in the, in, in Google and you can find, I have a Ted talk about it called the walk from uh, no to yes uh, that I did about 10 years ago. And, uh, and it's just been a, an endless series of adventures. I'll go check that out. That's tremendous. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, and you may have covered this. I do often like to end with just, just personal interest. Uh, again, this is about you. Are there uh, the things that you do that light you up that you do for inspiration? And I can tell by your life that most all of it fits in that. But if you were to look at it from a non-productive standpoint, an interest, a hobby, a things that you do uh, that just uh, give you joy, play, fun, even what would be on that list? Well, interestingly, <laughs> let's see, what would I come by? I, I would, I, I, well, it's just hanging out with family and uh, playing games <laughs> and laughing. And, uh, you know, we had a game night the other night with uh, the kids and uh, um, travel, you know, uh, in the past. I've really enjoyed that. You know, and I would come back to walking. Uh, you know, you don't have to walk, you know, like for a pace, but just saunter, you know, just walk, just, you don't have to set a pace, just walk, enjoy, breathe, walk for no reason at all. Yeah. But there's something about walking in nature, you know, just, uh, it's just, it's the simplest, it's the most basic human activity. It's made us human and uh, his walking and uh, and I just find walking with a friend, uh, walking with family, uh, just getting out there, you're side by side, and that's why that's why that's probably why I created this, <laughs> help create this Abraham path is just get people out walking because who yeah. fights when they're walking? You're side by side, you know. And uh, there's just something so simple uh, about it that I I love to do, but just. Yeah, I would say spending time with family and friends. Uh, last night I went out with two close uh, men friends. You know, I've known them for many, many years. But just hanging out, having a good meal, talking. I love that. Well, I appreciate the testimony, uh, Bill. I am new to walking, uh, if you can believe that. Uh, I have spent so many years, I was a pro cyclist and speed and, you know, now trail running. And I do, I, I, I admit, I do love it. I love the adrenaline and the flow of just going out and, and going at a high rate. Uh, and then we're at about three, actually just past three months. And I was on a big mountain bike, epic mountain bike ride with, with some guys, some buddies, and we were going full tilt. And I had the biggest wreck of my life, broke wow. seven, seven bones and partially collapsed the lung. Wow. So walking is about all I've been able to do and I am growing in that. So I want to take your testimony. I, I, I feel called to it some at this point too. That yeah. I'm eager to go fast again at some point. It's going to be a while. Um, but to walk and it's, it's a different, it's just different. I, I'm taking that as a, an epiphany for life right now of, uh, 
walking instead of running. I do want to ask about playing games because that's, I've got a big family. I got a lot of kids uh, and, and grandkids now. And uh, so you say game night with the kids. Give me a couple games you guys play. Well, we, the other night we were playing a game called Catan. Uh, oh, sure. We got that one. <laughs> and we have another game called Ticket to Ride. We got that one too. Okay. And we have a, uh, we have a big game closet here, but uh, the thing, funny thing about games, uh, I'm trying to think of the other games that we play, but it's like, it's like everyone has a fun. They're joking around and it's just a way of doing something together. You're not just looking at a screen, you're interacting, teasing each other. Yeah. And, uh, and <laughs> it's fun. I'll, I'll be doing it tonight. I think we've got 10, 12 people at the house and I know that'll be on tap. I'll give you another. Oh, we also play charades, you know, <laughs> sure. Uh, charade. One that's been uh, almost the most ag- agreeable one. Everybody wants to play is one. Uh, you can check it out. It's called um, Telestrations. Oh, we play Telestrations too. <laughs> yeah. yeah absolutely. That's been, we've that's got, great. we've got the expanded. Oh, one. we love it. Yeah, we usually have 12 people. Oh my gosh, the laughter that we've yeah. had on that and taking pictures, it's become part of our vernacular. Oh yeah. Now, Telestrations is definitely one of our favorites because it lends itself to creativity and uh, yeah, those kind of games where the, where you know, whether it's charades or Telestrations and uh yeah. where you're drawing something, you're creating something, you have to make something up. Yeah, it's just uh they're great. They're terrific. I I agree. Well, this has just been a gift. Um, thank you again, Bill, and, and for everybody to connect. We talked about that. Your website is, is it's William Yuri. It was dot org, correct? Yeah, dot org, right? Dot yeah. org. William and Yuri is U R Y. And then, of course, the book is possible how we survive and thrive in an age of conflict. And if you want to see us having fun here and, and laughing through the conversation, check us out and we'll have a bunch of clips on social media. It's Kevin Miller. Uh, CO, and we would really love to hear what you got out of this. Leave a review on Spotify or Apple Podcasts as well. And as always, if you want to learn more about your own drive, get my book, What Drives You. And until next time, uh, stay driven. And Bill, thank you. Huge pleasure, Kevin. Yeah.